PowerPoint slides. Thank you. you. We've had enough of those today. And what's interesting about that is I'm a millennial, so you would expect me to have PowerPoint, right? And all these visuals and digital. We don't need any of that, and that's the point of my talk. A lot of what we believe about generations isn't true. It's a good story, but it's not necessarily true. And what I want to do in the time we have is bring to life what research shows us is true. But I want to start with this morning. So how many of you woke up this morning? Come on, where's my people? <laughs> All right, <laughs> just checking. And, and how many of you woke up this morning and the first thing you did is you reached for your cell phone? Come on, right? Most of us? How many of you slept with your cell phone last night? Come on. Make it down. That's what I'm talking. That's great. So like you, I woke up this morning. Here's my phone. And I called my daughter, which I do every single day when I'm on the road. And I called her from this iPhone right here. How did I call her on this iPhone? FaceTime, there we go, right? Moms, parents, we, we know what FaceTime is for. So look up here. Look at the phone. So this morning, I'm talking with her. She's talking with me. We have this whole conversation going on. My daughter is four years old. She will never remember a time before you could look at the person on the phone while you were talking to them. And her belief system, what is true, what makes the world right, you will always have been able to see the person on the phone while you were talking with them. That is how the phone works. Right? The phone is broken if she can't see you. What was the cartoon where you could see the person you were talking to? The Jetsons, right? The Jetsons. She will think the Jetsons is about the past. Because what we discovered at our research center is technology is only new if you remember it the way it was before. Otherwise, that's all you know. That's the only way she knows to use a phone. If she picks up a landline, which we don't have one in our house, but if she did, the dial tone freaks her out. She's like, I, I, what's happening here? So as we think about this generation after millennials, which is who we study, as we think about this generation, what we start to discover are trends that you and I need to know. And the reason is this. We believe that the generation after millennials, we call them iGen, I'll explain in a second. We believe that you and I in this room, we have all the ages in here, will end up looking more like iGen than they will end up looking like us which means they'll affect all of us. In fact, what we discovered is seven-year-olds today in the U.S., right here, seven-year-olds today may have more in common with seven-year-olds in India than a 65-year-old in their own country. Oh, it gets better. So as we study generations, what we see is that the pace of change, the rate of change continues to increase, and what we believe is going to happen that you and I have to figure out is that instead of three or four generations in the workforce or as customers or in a room like this, we believe we're going to end up with six, maybe seven different generations at one time. Because generations are going to get shorter, they're going to get more compressed. Because what we're looking for are not birth years. Everybody wants to give you birth years. What we're looking for are behaviors. Predictability by scenario. That's a generation. Now, we use the birth years, we use geography as a framework for it, but a lot of what we believe to be true isn't necessarily accurate. So this generation, we call them iGen, like iPhone, iPad, you know what I'm talking about? You know, Apple, please don't sue me. We didn't trademark it, right? But they're i-everything. My daughter was potty trained using an iPad watching Dora the Explorer. That's what made her go to the bathroom. Don't ask me. Other generations, they put a jelly bean, whatever it was. The point is... It worked. So we call them iGen. Other people call them Gen Z, Centennials, different names. Bottom line, same exact generation. And what I want to share with you and have the conversation about is, what do we need to know about them if they are largely going to predict our future? So what do we need to know? At our center, it's called the Center for Generational Kinetics. All we do is study generations, how they're created, where they're trending, 
how do we get ahead of them? We help companies grow faster, we keep employees, we drive innovation, we get your kids to text you back. <laughs> That's important for about 10% of this audience. <laughs> like, tell us, Jason. But, but as we look at that, what we start to see is we want to see the trends that shape a generation, but also the ones that don't shape a generation. How many of you have heard a speaker on millennials before? Raise your hand, come on. It's like all of us, right? It's a big hot topic. Well, these speakers running around, for example, saying, oh, millennials, they're born 1980 to 2000. Okay, so we ask them, why do you say that? Well, 20 years, that doesn't mean anything. You pick two years of round numbers, great. What's the most important event that shaped millennials? 9-11, thank you, what year was that? Come on, give it to me. 2001, right? You cannot be born after 1995 and process the significance of September the 11th, 2001 in the way those born before 1995 do. End of story. Your brain's too young. You can't put it in a, a, a religious, cultural, geographic. You can't put it in any context. So I have to walk up on there and correct them and say, look, if 9-11 has always been history to you, you are not a millennial. You're iGen. If it didn't stop you in your tracks, boomers, we got some boomers in here, right? You could tell me about the JFK assassination, but I would never experience it in the way you did, would I? That's the point. If it doesn't change you, it's not part of your generation, those formative years. So we look at roughly 1996 to present. So what are the trends we need to know? I picked three that we study that are less obvious, because I love less obvious stuff. The number one trend that people don't talk about, that we believe will have a profound impact on all of us, with this new generation, diversity. iGen is the most diverse generation in US history. In fact, I'd like to make you uncomfortable about it. They are so diverse, they do not see diversity unless it's absent. Basically, until you walk into a room full of a bunch of white people, It's okay, my, my wife's Hispanic, you know? She would say she's Mexican, <laughs> I stay out of that deal, <laughs> right? She has 52 first cousins, I have six. <laughs> it works. <laughs> but I'm very sensitive to it now because my daughter has big brown eyes and big brown hair and she stands out in all the school photos. Right? She goes to an international school. So as we think about diversity, what does it mean? My daughter will never remember a time before there was an African-American president. That's normal. She will never remember a time before gay marriage. It's not that it will be an issue or a non-issue. It will be the past. Imagine how that affects things like voting. All this stuff that we're talking about. Right, because diversity is what's normal to you. That's what you and I experience. So diversity is one trend. Second trend that we're looking at is technology, but I want you to think differently about it. There's all this conversation that millennials are tech, come on, give it to me. Savvy, right? Well, we came out hard against that and said, no, millennials are not tech savvy. What we actually are, we are tech Dependent. Am I right? You're all living this, aren't you? We don't know how technology works. We just know we cannot live without it. And that's a big difference. So technology for millennials, when we talk to brands and all these employers and all these people, it's all about how do we enhance the digital experience, right? We're here at TEDx. How do we enhance this experience? What's the hashtag? What's this? For iGen, it's the opposite. Technology is the experience. If you've always gone to Amazon and had your stuff delivered within two hours, you have no context for having to go to the grocery store. And these trends are all going to ripple up. So we look at diversity, we look at technology, a third one, one of my personal favorite and the most controversial I'll share, parenting. Millennials, we got a bunch of us here, our parents were who? What generation? Baby boomers. And baby boomers had a distinct parenting philosophy that absolutely came back to haunt them. <laughs> and we thank you <laughs> and no you cannot have your gas card back 
Sorry, <laughs> that was probably a little too personal. <laughs> But what nobody talks about, so, so the generation that is parenting iGen are Gen X and, and millennials, right? My wife is Gen X, I'm a millennial, that's just the way it is. But what nobody's talking about that we discovered at our center, check this out, you gotta look at me here and see my hands. So we're a big generation, for example, in the US millennials are 79.8 million. We're born about 1977 to 1995, roughly, right? Generations are clues, they're not a box, okay? There's about 80 million of us. What we see is this. We see that the generation, and look, nobody wants to talk about this. I did 22 interviews last Thursday. Nobody asked about this. It's too controversial, but it is what it is. About 80 million of us. What we believe is happening is the generation is actually splitting. It's breaking in two, and you're ending up with two different trajectories. Hang with me. One part of the generation is doing everything we were told we were supposed to do. Now, statistically, we're doing it two to three late years later than other generations, right? We're getting married later, we're having kids later, all these things. We're still doing it, though. But no one wants to talk about us. How many of you in this room are millennials right now? Raise your hand. Right? What day of the week is it today? Sunday. We're here on a Sunday. Okay? <laughs> Boom. And we didn't get a ribbon for showing up, did we? No. Would have been nice. So there's one part of the generation doing everything we're supposed to. There's another part of the generation that's not creating what we call real world traction. Watch carefully. So as the generation splits, for some reason, we don't know why yet, around the age of 30, you self-select into one part of the generation or the other, and you can no longer relate to the other part of your own generation. It just doesn't work. There's a point you go, what's wrong with you? I don't identify with you anymore. How many of you have experienced this? It finally explains how we're a millennial, but we don't like the millennial name because our pants aren't falling off. Yeah. Right? I know, it gets on your nerves, doesn't it? So as we split, in fact, the group most offended by millennials acting entitled are other millennials <laughs> who do not feel entitled. Am I right? Because they're giving the rest of us a bad reputation. They're making it harder for the rest of us. Now, what does this mean to iGen? Well, let's pretend that they all still continue to parent. If you're 35 years old, you've got a kid or two kids, and you're on your own with whatever that relationship looks like, you're making it happen. Do you parent differently than the 30 or 35-year-old with the same number of kids who still lives with your mom? I don't have the answer, but I want to ask the question. So as we look ahead, just notice parenting is the greatest trend that influences behaviors across generations. So as we put all this together, what I want you to notice is generations, the change that we're looking for is actually rippling up rather than down. All of us in here were taught that generations start at the top, oldest, and they go down to youngest. But what we're seeing now, and the reason iGen is so important, is it's starting with the youngest and moving up. I'll prove it. Some of y'all are kind of confused. Let me prove it. My daughter's born. Okay, very excited. My daughter's name is Raya, R-Y-A. She's named after my great-grandmother, Raya. When my daughter turned two, we found out that wasn't my great-grandmother's name. <laughs> <laughs> but what you gonna do? <laughs> Apparently that was her nickname. We were close, it was fine. It's on the pillows, no problem. <laughs> my daughter's born, very excited. I'm taking photos, I'm putting them on Facebook, right? And then my mom's there, now grandma's, very excited. She's like, oh, when am I going to get to hold the photos? I'm like, mom, I've already put them on Facebook. She says, well, how am I going to hold the photos? I'm like, here's my phone, mom. And if you swipe this way. So my mom had to do what? I felt she had to join what? Facebook, right? So she joins Facebook. Eventually she finds her old high school sweetheart. <laughs> right? It's gross. They're all Facebook talking. Ugh. I'm saying this on behalf of all millennials. And now grandma is on Facebook more than me. She's on Facebook so much, I'm doing what? Leaving. <laughs> and I post the party, I'm at the TEDx after party. Woo, chick, chick. What happens? Grandma likes it, and then she comments. She comments. She comments. She's, oh, it looks like you're having so much fun. Be safe, if you need a ride, call me. <laughs> You're killing my game, mom! 
But what I want you to notice is it started with the youngest and spread to the oldest. Okay. Older generations are finally starting to look more like younger generations. And as we look at these trends in particular technology, what you see is the greatest predictor of the future of older generations are what the younger generations are doing today. So as we look ahead, why is this so important? It's not just that it's our future. Um, iGen will put many companies out of business. You want me to come buy a car? You want me to drive there? That's weird. And now you're looking at me? Stop looking at me. Well, you think we're going to go to a bank? Yeah, like we got cash. <laughs> right, next thing you know, you want me to carry an emergency check. <laughs> But what I want you to notice is this. The gentleman that spoke before me, 16 years old, blew my mind with the drone business. Y'all with me? Was that not amazing? Was that not amazing? He's 16, and that's my point. We've had people on this stage from 60-something to 16, and every one of them has had something great to offer. Am I right? And what we believe is that the conversation around generations is backwards. It's all about differences, and they're different from us. This timeless generational friction, you know? The young people look at the old people and go, ha, oh, you're outdated. <laughs> what are you doing with that flip phone? <laughs> and the older generation's looking at the young people going, you don't know anything. You don't have any experiences. You don't use commas. what we believe at our center is that we need to change the conversation and recognize the fact that every single generation in this room brings something that's important and necessary. And frankly, we all agree with me that the issues and challenges we're facing today are too big and too important for us not to focus on our generational strengths rather than our differences. Am I right? And it's personal to me, and I get fired up about it, but that's because my daughter's four years old. When I go home and see her tonight, right, when I look at her, I don't just see her brown eyes and her, her big hair, and, you know, she runs up, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. I see her generation. I mean, yeah, I think about sometimes how hard it was for my wife and I to have a kid. I think about the future that we all want for everyone that we know and love, and even those we don't. And what I want to ask for you is to help me to work across generations to unlock all of our strengths. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, guys.